Um, okay, well, um, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, I know many of you and I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you. Um, I've been around Royal Free Unit, Re Royal Free Renal Unit for probably 15 years or more. Um, so um, I haven't got, uh, they haven't got fed up of me and I haven't got fed up of them. So, so we must both be doing something right, I guess. Um, I'm now Professor of Nephrology and um, I spend most of my, I spend half my time still doing clinical work in the Royal Free and the wards and doing clinics and half my time doing research and teaching of new doctors. And I work on kidney disease around the world, but I also have a particular interest in diabetes and the kidney. And I guess the other thing I thought this is, you know, it's a depressing time at the moment. We are in a cost of living crisis. There are wars. We've had COVID. There are so many bad news stories at the moment. And I thought it would be nice to talk about a good news story because really the treatment of diabetes has been revolutionized in the last five years, particularly for those patients with kidney disease. So I thought it would be worth just 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 talking about that and and then taking questions and answers. There will be some science in here. I hope I will put it in a way that everyone can understand and I'll try and explain anything I show that looks scientific um, in as in as clearly as possible. But I'm, I, I, hope, I hope it's not too complicated. But equally, I will go from first principles. So I thought I would talk a little bit about what diabetes is, about the burden of diabetes among the kidney population, which is huge, and then talk about these treatments, uh, particularly old treatments and then new treatments and how the whole landscape has changed and what difference that's going to make to everybody. So um, if that's all right, I'll crack on. And... Um, I guess the first question is what is diabetes? And diabetes is simply too much glucose in your blood. And too much glucose in your blood can be for lots of reasons, but too much glucose in your blood causes damage. It causes damage to um, muscles, brains, blood vessels, livers, kidneys, all kinds of things. So it's diabetes is a systemic disease. Um, and it's caused by having too much glucose in your blood. And there are two major reasons why people have diabetes. It's the kind of diabetes we all hear about when we are young, which is type one diabetes, where the organ, the pancreas that makes insulin, which is a key hormone, which sends glucose from your blood into your cells is lacking. And in fact, if you have type one diabetes, what's happened is your pancreas has completely failed to produce, failed, completely fails to produce insulin. And that's often due to an autoimmune disease in childhood, but I guess theoretically it can happen from surgery, or for another, another reason you'd happen to lose your pancreas. So, so although most people are kind of teenagers or young or, or children when they develop type one diabetes, it can happen in later life. Um, and that, that kind of diabetes probably is increasing slightly in prevalence, but it's nothing compared to type two diabetes. And type two diabetes is what affects the vast majority of people with kidney disease. And I'm, again, I'm not expecting you to read all this. All I want you to see is that there's fat cells here muscle cells here and the liver here and what these three organs do is respond to too much too much in the way of calories so if you if if, if uh these organs are exposed to too much in the way of calories they convert from doing what they normally should do to not being able to handle those calories and do something which is called become insulin resistant which means that the insulin that's being released from the pancreas and the pancreas in, in, in type two diabetes is generally, at least at the beginning, reasonably well preserved, that the pancreas can still produce insulin. The tissues that are important for responding to insulin don't respond to insulin anymore. And that's particularly the fat tissue, that's particularly muscle tissue and particularly liver, the liver. And so that means that, that, that although you've got enough insulin, it's not working properly. And in fact, it doesn't really matter whether you haven't got enough insulin or the insulin you have isn't working well enough. The, out, the consequences of that are actually pretty similar. So let me just, just re rehearse why people, with, why people get type 2 diabetes. We understand why people get type 1 diabetes. Their pancreas stops working. That's usually an immune condition in childhood. Can occasionally happen if you have a major operation to have your pancreas removed. But... Type 2 diabetes, which is the vast majority of the diabetes we see in this country, is caused by fundamentally too many calories. Now, that, when I say too many calories, that, that's different for any single person. So there's clearly a genetic, underlying genetic vulnerability to this. Some people have genes that mean they can tolerate excess calories much better 
than other people. And I'll show you some other slides in a minute which really reinforce that. And what happens is that the way you normally store all those ex excess calories, and that is in the liver, the fat, and the, and the muscle, is overwhelmed. And those things mean that you become insulin resistant. So although people have different risks, the fact that, they, that, that there's in the, over a period of probably decades, there's been an excess calorie intake leads them to becoming resistant to insulin. And I've said it's big. I just want to show you how big. So this, this is about the world, and I'll show you a bit about London in a minute. But this is about the world. Now, Europe here is green. And at the moment, we're at about, uh, we make up, oh, I don't know, about a, a, a sixth of those with diabetes in the world. Um, you can see that um, overall there's, I think what they think is 360 million or 370 million people with diabetes. And that's set to almost double in the next 15 years. And that doubling isn't going to occur here in London or Europe. It's going to occur in, in countries in South Asia, countries in the Western Pacific, countries in South and Central America and Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's because people in those countries haven't previously been exposed to excess calorie intake and now will be like we have been in this country for many years and, and basically that excess calorie intake comes along with urbanization people moving to cities from an agricultural environment to an urban environment and that's happened in this country 100 years ago but it happened it's only now happening in many lower income countries and confounding that of course is the fact that people who live in those countries often have different genetics which make them more vulnerable to diabetes. So we're going to see huge increase in diabetes in other parts of the world. There will be an increase here as well. We're not expecting it to stop, but there will be huge increases in, um, in other parts of the world. And you can see here the list just by the number of people, and these are obviously the biggest countries, but you can see where, where, where the problem is going to happen. Okay. Here's London. And there's, this is another, another kind of picture I want to show you. And um, I, I don't know if you've got eagle eyes, but this is a picture of London of, um, um, and the boroughs on the, on the left hand one. You can see the, the boroughs that we, we cover are um, Hamden here, Islington here, Haringey here, Enfield, Barnet. And I think we're also out of London a bit as well. Some of you may be from outside London, but we're in this north central sector. And this figure on the right here shows the number of people dying from diabetes related, uh, diabetes related causes. That includes kidney disease, but it can also be hearts and, 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 and other, other complications of diabetes. And you can see that there are two big, well, two concentrations of, of, of areas where people die from diabetes. That's in West London and North Central, sorry, North Central East London. And I guess what this other, this other, this other slide shows is the number of non-white, non, non, the percentage of non-white population in each of those, in all those, in all of London. And you can see that the areas with most diabetes deaths are the areas with the most non-white population. In fact, you can eat in North Central London, it's absolute classic division. If you look at the area that we cover, the western side of our area, which is Camden and West Barnet, are relatively white and we're relatively well off. And you can see the number of diabetes related deaths in that area are actually very small. It's white, this band of white that runs up north out of London. And actually, the number, the number of complicated diabetes problems we have there are relatively low. But as soon as we cross the Holloway Road, I guess, um, things change. And that is partly socioeconomic changes, but it's also changes in ethnicity mix. And ethnicity mix, ethnicity is a huge risk factor for the amount of calories that anyone needs to take before their, their, their systems get overwhelmed. So you can see that in, in North Central London, we have a big problem even if it's only half our catchment area, it's certainly we have a huge problem with problems, complications of due to diabetes. So that's how big the diabetes problem is. So why is diabetes particularly a problem in patients with kidney disease? Well, first and most obviously, diabetes causes kidney disease. It's the commonest cause of kidney disease in this country. And frankly, we have been terrible at addressing Addressing that, you know, this is the biggest cause of kidney failure in the world now, probably it used not to be, but I'm sure by now it is. And certainly in this country, and yet the amount of investment in terms of research and, um, and innovation and in brilliant minds um, that have gone into this has been tiny. So we have really failed, uh, at least until recently, 
in dealing in, in, in addressing the fact that because diabetes is the biggest cause of kidney disease. So, so when we talk about kidney charities and kidney fundraising and kidney everything else, we should be talking about diabetes because it is such a big portion of what we of what we deal with. Diabetes also occurs in people with CKD, not as a cause of their kidney disease. They may have kidney disease for another reason, um, but they may have diabetes anyway. Diabetes is a very common condition between you know up to 10% of the population will have diabetes, depending which age group you look in, maybe more. And so a lot of, a lot of people have diabetes and a lot of people have chronic kidney disease. So the two may come along together and managing diabetes in people with kidney disease can be a bit challenging. So we need to talk a little bit about that as well. And then lastly, and those with transplants will know about this, we worry about diabetes as a consequence, not so much of kidney disease itself, although there are some questions about that, but particularly the treatments we give as part of kidney disease. And those who've received immune suppression, whether that's for an inflammatory disease like vasculitis, or those who are receiving immune suppression for their transplants will know that we worry about the risk of diabetes very much in those groups of people, because the drugs we know increase that risk. And that risk in, is, is very much that same risk we talked about in terms of becoming insulin resistant. Those, the drugs we talk about are not, are not causing a reduction in insulin supply. What they are doing is lowering that threshold for the amount of calories you need before your system is overwhelmed and you can no longer deal, manage the sugar anymore and you become insulin resistant. And that's that, that occur, with the drugs that we've talked with, with the immune suppressive drugs, that's what happens. So just to go this, into this in a bit more detail, this is the number, this is from the UK renal registry. These are people on dialysis. You can see diabetes, as documented here, makes up 31% of people on, on dialysis. Um, I would say that this is probably an underestimate of the total number of people with kidney disease, because I think probably as a portion of people who end up on dialysis, probably more people with diabetes may die before they, before they receive dialysis. So, so probably the number of people with kidney disease and, and diabetes is higher than that. Um, but on dialysis, that we, re we reckon about a third of people on dialysis have a diabetes as a cause of kidney disease. And you can see other causes down here, and how, if we compare it to things like glomerulonephritis, includes IgA or vasculitis, polycystic kidney disease, um, lots we still don't know about, congenital disorders. You can see they're all relatively small compared to the large, large portion of people with diabetes. So diabetes, management of diabetes in, in, in chronic kidney disease, I'll talk about more as we go forward. So I'm, I'm gonna skip over that. And then just a bit about diabetes post-transplant. So I'm gonna show you lots of these curves going forward. So this is a sciencey bit, I'm sorry about this. I, I'm just gonna explain, uh, I'll explain them several times. Um, these curves, and you might see them a lot in, in research papers and you might see them in the news. And what they are is they are descriptions of the number of people either with or without a particular something happening. And in this case, it's the number of people developing diabetes after a transplant. And you can see it's a percentage up here, and it's almost always a percentage up here, and it goes from zero to 100. And there here is time, and it, this out goes out to 25 weeks or about half a year. And you can see um, that as you go along, um, when you start, this is people without diabetes to start with. So this doesn't include people with diabetes as a cause of their kidney failure. This is people without diabetes as a cause of their kidney failure. 100% um, people don't have diabetes when they get their transplant. But in the six months following someone's transplant, about 15 to 20% of people will develop diabetes. And that's even since we've minimized the use of steroids. So we always thought steroids were the worst culprit for this, but most of you will know we try and reduce the amount of steroids we use. And in fact, the drug we think that's most responsible for this is tacrolimus. But tacrolimus is such a brilliant drug in so many other ways that we accept the risk of diabetes and, and deal with it when it happens rather than, than, than not using tacrolimus because tacrolimus prevents rejection brilliantly. So, so we do use that, we continue to use tacrolimus, but there's still this risk is there. And so if up, after six months after transplant, 20% of people have developed diabetes, that's also something we need to really, really be thinking about. And again, hasn't been the focus up until recently. So let's just talk a little bit about what we did. I'll talk very briefly about what we used to do with diabetes. And I think one part of this is really important because... Sorry, can you contribute or be just listening to it? Sorry, someone got a question? No? Okay. Um, so reducing carbohydrate in intake and, and behaviour interventions can make a big difference. Um, so if you look at this, um, this is a study from 20 years ago. And again, we, here we can see these graphs again. 
Again, time at the bottom, this time it's years. So it goes out to 13 years. And again, it's percentage. And this time it's a bad thing happening. This is dying. So um, you, want, you want this line to stay at zero and it's going up over these 15 years. And it compares two different treatment, two different interventions here. And the intervention here is not, there are some drugs involved in this intervention, things like blood pressure tablets. But if you read the, the list of things that were being done here, it's about reducing calorie intake, particularly from fat and reducing the kind of fat that's taken because it's probably important whether you have saturated fat or unsaturated fat and exercise and stopping smoking. And those were the big interventions here. And you can see that already even 20 years ago, we knew this made a big difference. If you took these interventions and the risk of, um, of, of, of dying were down at 20, between 20 and 30 percent, whereas they were much higher if, um, if, if you didn't take these interventions. There's also some blood pressure tablets and vitamins as well. But that, this is a long standing intervention. This works. This I wouldn't be advocating for changing. This, of course, is really important. And I think this is just to highlight how important behavioural change and and um, and dietary and exercise interventions can make a big difference. They don't make a difference quickly. I think that's the other thing to notice that, you know, it takes five, six, seven, eight years before these two lines start to separate. So it's a long, hard haul. But if you can get if when someone develops diabetes, if over the if 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 over the next five years you can really change some of the lifestyle things, that can make a big, a massive difference in the longer term. But that's that's not that's kind of number one take home message. Oh, what's happening here? Okay, so this is insulin. This is very historic. These old men, or not old men, they were young at the time, but they're black and white photos. So they are taken in the 1920s. They are Best Bant and Colopa McLeod, and they won the Nobel Prize for extracting insulin from dog pancreases. And diabetes was, until the 1920s, a fatal disease. There was no, tr there was no treatment except not giving children sugar or any carbohydrate, in fact, and so they'd, they'd die from malnutrition. So, so there was no treatment until the 1920s, until these gentlemen, they're, from, they're Canadians, these four Canadians extracted insulin from dog pancreases. And that is how insulin was invented. And that now is not how insulin is made. Insulin is now made what's called recombinantly, which is made from cells. You could get grow cells in the lab and they produce insulin and then you, you just get the insulin out of the solution that the cells are in. So it's, it's not made from dogs anymore, which has lots of advantages. Um, but it's, it's, it's still the same thing. It's the same molecule and that saves lives. There's another tablet that's used in people with type 2 diabetes called glyclozide, and this is many of you will have, have had, or Diamicron, it was its, its brand name, and many will have known about that. And these were two treatments that were used for a long time. And they do control, they provide more insulin, so they will do reduce the amount of blood sugar. They reduce the blood sugar in the blood, so there's the concentration of blood sugar in the blood. But they lead to a problem, which I've written at the bottom, which if you give insulin, you gain more weight. And as we've discussed, one of the problems in type 2 diabetes is that the weight gain causes more insulin resistance. So you're actually going around in a circle here, a vicious cycle, where your condition has arisen because you're overweight, and yet you give a treatment which makes you get more overweight. Although it controls the blood sugar in the short term, it actually makes the condition harder to manage in the long term. So this is a big problem, particularly people with type 2 diabetes. It's not such a problem with type 1 diabetes because they're not insulin resistant. They just haven't got enough insulin. So taking insulin is fine. But if you've got type 2 diabetes, the problem is all because you're resistant to insulin. So giving more insulin to overcome that resistance is kind of OK in the short term, but causes a bigger problem in the long term. And that has been a major issue with management of diabetes, particularly in kidney disease for a long time. The other drug that does work very well is metformin and this this drug many of you will know um, and um, this drug increases in actually this drug's been around for 30 or 40 years and to be absolutely honest no one still understands how it works but it does what it does do is make you more sensitive to insulin so the insulin resistance goes away a little bit and why no one really knows but it works and so people have carried on using it I'll talk about a little problem with it in a minute. There have been various other drugs over the last 20 or 30 years, but um, they don't work or they cause harm, and so they haven't been used. Just while we're going through historic treatments, many of you will have been taking or will be taking um, drugs that are called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor drug, uh, blockers, like Ramipril or Losartan. 
these control blood pressure, but they are they control blood pressure in a particular way, which protects the kidney, particularly in diabetes, but in all forms of kidney disease from it, from requiring dialysis. Again, you've got this same lines you've got a bottom line with people on the treatment of in this case losartan which is an angiotensin 2 receptor blocker versus not taking that medicine where then you're much more likely to end up on dialysis and um and also these protect you from dying similarly cholesterol tablets have a similar effect so these two medicines aren't really treatment for diabetes but they're a very important part of the treatment that people with diabetes have had and should continue to have Okay, so that's been the past. And um, why was it such a problem? Well, man, insulin in, in CKD is problematic because it, insulin is partly broken down by the kidney. So not only is there the weight gain that's the problem, there's also the problem that comes about because if you take a dose of insulin, you've got kidney failure, there's a big risk you take too much insulin. And in fact, what I, so I run a diabetes kidney clinic in the Royal Free, and Often patients come into my clinic saying, doctor, doctor, it's great. My blood sugars are under control for the first time in 10 years. And um, I'm even having some low blood sugars. I've never had that before. It's brilliant. And I, of course, go, no, that's not brilliant. Because what that means is your kidney function has deteriorated. So one of the first signs of someone's deteriorating kidney function can, in fact, be hyperglycemia because they've taken too much insulin because the kidney can't get rid of it. Metformin is a great drug, as I said. No one knows how it works. But unfortunately, we can't really use it in people with advanced kidney disease. The risk, there are risks associated with it which make it difficult. Ramapril and ACE inhibitors are good, but many of you will have had that phone call at um, usually midnight, I think, after clinic saying your potassium's too high. And Ramapril is a big, big exacerbator of that problem or any of the ACE inhibitors or, or, or angiotensin II receptor blockers. So that's challenging. And if you're on dialysis, blood sugar control can be even more difficult because blood because sugar will get sucked out on dialysis leading to hypoglycemia and then rebound when you come off dialysis so many people on hemodialysis will have real problems with blood sugar control less of a problem on peritoneal dialysis but a but a bit of a problem on on, on hemodialysis that's why it's all been a bit of a bleak outlook up until five or six years ago and in the last five or six years there have been the release of at least three different treatments, which are really, really revolutionising um, diabetes treatment. And somewhat, sometimes not quite the way we thought they were going to do, but still revolutionising it nonetheless. So this is the, 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 um, the more exciting bit of the, of the talk. So many, you may or may not have heard of SGLT2 inhibitors. They are made from a substance that's found in apple tree bark, florazin. So the, the, old, the old adage that an apple a day keeps a doctor away may in fact be true um, because um, inside apple tree bark particularly, which I don't think most people eat, but anyway, um, are substances which block the reuptake of sugar from the urine. So sugar, when it goes, so this is a picture on the right here is a picture of a kidney. This is the blood going in and blood going out in the red. And the urine gets produced in this, in this tubule here going out and then out to the real world. And all the glucose in your blood will get passed into your filtrate or what's gonna be your urine, pass into the urine immediately. It doesn't get kept in the blood, it goes into the urine. But because if you're in health, you'll suck it all up, back up again in this first part of the tubule. Normally you don't want to lose sugar in your urine because you want to keep all your sugar because it's good for you, know, you need it. So you, the kidney has evolved to suck all the sugar up um, that, that gets filtered uh, from the kidney back into the bloodstream. But the SGLT2 inhibitors block this process. And this channel here is called SGLT2, which is why um, it's called an SGLT2 inhibitor. For those that are interested, sodium glucose transporter 2. Um, so that's blocked, which means that instead of the glucose ending up back in your bloodstream, it ends up out in your urine and out in the real world. And there are three of these that are licensed in the UK. They are dapagliflozin, empagliflozin and canagliflozin. And for the purposes, as far as I'm aware, there is no difference between them, which is great because it's oh, no, it makes them cheaper. Um, and here we're seeing these lines again. And um, again, this, is, this happens to be Dapaga flows, and it doesn't matter which one. Um, and here we've got time, and here we've got a whole bunch of bad events that can happen in each of these four panels. Um, this is a combination of dying and kidney failure. This, this one here on the right is the development of kidney failure. And you can see over, this is just two years 
So this is a much shorter timeline than I've shown you in any of the other graphs. This is just two years and you see a almost 40% reduction after two years. So 35% reduction in, um, in, in risk of, of dialysis after two years. That's absolutely huge. That is, that's bigger than everything else that's come before and it's coming very, very quickly. So this is really interesting because these drugs, I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go on for too much longer, but these drugs were invented as, as glucose managing treatment. They, they were given to people with diabetes 10 or 15 years ago. They, they came onto the market and they did. They made you pee out blood, they made, made you pee out sugar and they reduced people with diabetes sugar by a, a little bit, but they were okay. And um, they gave people a bit of thrush, so they weren't used very much. Um, and everyone said they won't work in people with kidney disease because they work on the kidney and people with kidney disease, their kidneys don't work. And indeed, if you give these drugs to someone with kidney disease, their blood sugar doesn't change very much because the glucose isn't being excreted in the kid by the kidney anyway. So, so these drugs don't, in fact, work by making you excrete sugar. They do something else, which, again, we're not really so sure. But what they do is absolutely fantastic. So they may help you. So they may help someone with diabetes and CKD help control their blood sugar a little bit. But mostly they are being prescribed now to stop those people needing dialysis. And that is absolutely huge. And this just to kind of so two more graphs, and these are a bit different, these graphs, just to look at the, the, the predicted. This, is, this isn't real data. This is what people think is going to happen over the next 20 years. So this, these graphs over the next 20 years, if you look on the, on the graph on the right, there's 20 years on the bottom. And again, you've got 100% up here. But this time, at the beginning, we've got all the people here with CKD in light blue. Light blue CKD to stage 2, stage 3A, 3B and four and five. And the pink is stage five, pre-dialysis, orange is dialysis, and red is transplant. So these are the people reaching end stage renal failure, the pink, the orange, and the, um, and the red. And the people that, uh, the people that <laughs> without this treatment, within 10 or 12 years, almost everyone's CKD has progressed, and many people are on dialysis and transplant, and many people have died. If you look, if you give this treatment, the numbers in that pink, orange, and red group have gone have, have diminished huge amount our dialysis centers will no longer be under the pressure they're under people will no longer need kidney transplants it is a huge benefit now people will still die because people will die from other things a lot of people who have diabetes are elderly so we can't expect to completely stop people dying but we can expect to stop people dying with kidney failure and, and this is going to have a huge huge benefit um, I'm going to rush quickly through two more treatments because I think people I should leave time for questions. So there are a bunch of drugs called incretins, of which there are two, two types. Um, some of you have maybe used to taking linagliptin or citagliptin. These are called DPP-4 antagonists. They are tablets. They probably help control blood sugar very well. They may not <coughs> protect people from kidney failure so well. Unlike the GLP-1 agonists, which are usually injections, often once a week, Many of you may have come across them. They're dulaglutide, zenotide, liraglutide, and semaglutide. And again, these have very similar effects. If we look at this panel here of, of um, people um, needing dialysis. Uh, um, I think this, sorry, this is, this is changing GFR. This isn't people needing dialysis. So in the green here is people taking insulin and um, they, 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 their kidney function falls. But the people taking these other drugs, this, this is dulaglutide, their kidney function is preserved. The drug I'll mention is um, penenerone, um, which is a different kind of diuretic, um, which <coughs> may have had to come across. And this drug also has marginally benefit. There are some other drugs in the, in the experimental experiments, it's still experimental, which we shan't talk about here. So what did, what did diabetes treatment look like 10 years ago? Oh. So metformin was around, it was a great, it's a good drug, it still is a good drug and I would recommend people can continue to take it, but it's a problem once you get advanced chronic kidney disease and CKD stage four, five or dialysis, although people can again take it once they've had a transplant, which is great. And then after that, we only had ACE inhibitors and statins, which are good treatments, but they don't treat the diabetes and insulin and glicoside and the other self, uh, similar drugs, um, which are okay and they help control the blood sugar, but they caused weight gain. And that was a huge problem. And now we've got drugs that don't cause weight gain. In fact, many of these drugs cause weight loss. The two drugs I've just mentioned to you, the SGLT2 inhibitors, that's dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, and empagliflozin, and the injections once a week, GLP-1s, that's the semaglutide, the dulaglutide, they actually cause weight loss. 
So that's brilliant because that's actually cutting into the vicious cycle of people who are who are um, who've got high sugars getting and, and taking insulin and getting more overweight and becoming more insulin resistant, needing more insulin, and that vicious cycle which we can't get on top of. So so these drugs are brilliant because they, they interrupt that vicious cycle. So SGLT2 inhibitors, we could, we know we can certainly safely use down to an EGFR of 20 and maybe probably right down to dialysis. We don't know yet about dialysis. Um, there's a trial going on or just about to start of looking at whether these drugs help in dialysis. Now, they work on the kidney, so I don't quite know how they would work in dialysis if you're not passing urine, but they might. It might be something we don't understand about them. And similarly, transplant, there's been some anxiety about using them in people who have got kidney transplants or taking immune suppression. I've actually noticed a lot of transplant physicians are using them anyway. I think they will, um, that we haven't got the trials yet. There is a trial that's kind of going. We've been trying to conduct another trial for a while. Um, but I suspect most transplant physicians will be using these drugs because they will work just as well in people with transplants as well. Um, I think the anxiety relates to people becoming dehydrated, but I think most transplant uh, um, uh, uh, recipients are really good at stopping themselves becoming dehydrated, so I think those risks are pretty low, um, but they're not yet licensed. So, so only, only licensed to CKD4. GLP-1 and, uh, and agonists, these drugs, the injections, once a week injections, certainly down to needing dialysis. There's no real evidence in dialysis or transplantation. I don't know when there will be. I think people are using them. Um, and the, the, the new uh, diuretic drug I've been talking about probably is only going to be useful in early CKD. And then we've got the old fashioned treatments as well. So really these two new drugs, the SGLT2 are revolutionary. What we've, no one's ever tested is whether you take, if you take both, you end up with double the benefit. And I suspect the answer is yes. No, no, so I think the answer is probably the benefits are going to be even greater than if you took one or one or the other. So if that's the case, we can, we've got a really optimistic future. I haven't really mentioned type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes has changed a bit. There are continuous monitors, insulin pumps, potentially artificial intelligence that can work out how much insulin to give. And maybe even some of these drugs will be useful in people with type 1 diabetes. But that area is yet to be fully explored. So. Um, the benefits are huge. Do they add up? Probably. And if they do, then the future really is bright. Um, thank you for listening. I'm sorry I rushed a bit and I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you. Fantastic, Ben. Thank you very much. You've uh, taught me some a lot of things that I wasn't aware of. So thank you for that. Uh, OK, I want to ask you a question, Ben. Um, um, I had my first transplant 23 years ago. For the first 18 years of my transplant, um, I didn't have diabetes. Everything was fine. Um, and then five years ago, after my second transplant, I had a, uh, I got diabetes. I didn't have, um, uh, uh, gosh, the sorry. My brain's not working. The medication that they give you straight after is to strengthen you, beginning with S. Um, uh, the, the, the steroids. Thank you, Jill. Bless you. Uh, I only had that for maybe four, six weeks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much impact it had. Uh, so tell me, what could have been the reason why uh, I developed uh, type 2 diabetes? So, I mean, yeah, great question. And, and, and you're absolutely right. So I think um, there's, there's the, the big elephant in the room, David, and I, and I, I, I hate to say this, and that's age. Um, and that is you've got older since your last transplant, and yeah. there's nothing anyone can do about that. So the biggest risk that changes from the time of your first transplant to the time of your second transplant is you're older. And age is definitely a risk factor for becoming insulin resistant. So that's number one. You're right that steroids are a risk, and one of the reasons why we've been so keen to stop steroids early, and we now do that as a routine, unless we, there's a reason not to, is because they also increase the risk of diabetes. But the third drug, or the third thing that no one is avoiding, because we still use it all the time, is tacrolimus. And tacrolimus does cause, we know, tacrolimus causes diabetes. And I mean, I don't know whether there'll be an, 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 another drug to replace tacrolimus in the near future. There have been new drugs, but they've never worked as well in terms of preventing rejection. And so it's always, it's always, you know, tacrolimus for all it, you know, for all the negative things about diabetes and blood pressure and various other little things it does, 
for what the, the, the adverse effects compared to any other immune suppressive drug are, are actually very small. And its efficiency at preventing rejection are brilliant. And, and you know, um, I don't know if anyone's had a transplant in the pre, well, pre certainly pre tacrolimus years, but the pre calcineurin inhibitor years. And, you know, people were on huge doses of steroids. They were, they were, you know, often had their spleens removed. They had all kinds of horrible things done to try and try and prevent them rejecting their kidneys. And, and, um, and often it didn't work. Um, whereas now, tacrolimus does stop people rejecting. You know, rejection isn't a big problem. And that's because of tacrolimus. So, so yes, it has, you know, it does increase the risk of diabetes. And basically what you're looking in all these cases is a threshold. And what happens is as you get older, that threshold goes up. If you give someone tacrolimus, that threshold goes up. And so eventually you, you, you reach the threshold where you become diabetic. And, 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 and I, I guess that's what happened to you, David. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I got old. Okay, Jill, uh, you've got a question. Yes, Ben, thank you. Um, I, I was pleased to hear that you didn't mention anything about blindness amongst uh, kidney patients. I have a friend in Canada who has diabetes, but she's not a kidney patient. And she's just told me she's been registered illegally blind because mm -hmm. of the diabetes. But yeah. it doesn't, doesn't seem sorry. to have affected you, um, the kidney patients. Luckily. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I, so I... Um, we do. There are there are patients with kidney disease who are also have have. Di I mean, diabetic diabetic retinopathy or diabetic eye disease is very kind of at the, at the microscopic level, very similar to diabetic kidney disease. And so often they come together. People with type one diabetes tend to be more affected by the people with type two diabetes. Although people with type two diabetes do also get um, eye disease. Um, the treatments for for retinopathy have also improved hugely. There are now. Um, what are called VEGF inhibitors. These are, you used to have to have laser, you used to have a laser shot in your eye to blast the new, you'd get new blood vessels growing, which would then bleed. And, um, and you used to have to have these shot with a laser beam. That was, that was the treatment for, for, for diabetic eye disease, which you can imagine if you had to keep having it, wasn't great, great for you. Mm -hmm. um, but there are now injections that can go into the eye that, that actually prevent those blood vessels growing and that they are hugely successful. So, um, if caught early, and I know that diabetic eye screening is something that people are invited to every year, and I would encourage people to attend, if caught early, um, diabetic eye disease is much less of a problem than it used to be. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that question, Jill. Uh, Naran, thank you for your question. Can you say a little bit more about the pros and cons of continuous monitoring of blood sugars in type 1 diabetes? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I think there are mainly pros and very few cons. So I guess what we're talking about is the kind of um, blood glucose monitor that attaches to the skin, for those that don't know about it, and you wear for a few days. Um, they have a monitor that, so you don't have to prick your finger every few hours to check your blood sugar. What you have is a thing that's a, a kind of a, a, a plastic uh, a dressing which attaches to your to your often your shoulder or your arm. And it has a little needle that is inserted under the skin and it sits there continuously. And, and there's an app on your phone and you put your phone next to it and it will tell you what your blood sugar is. Um, and so I guess there are some technical issues, which I think have got a lot better. So sometimes the monitors get misplaced. They, you know, they, they, the, the, the probe that sits under the skin moves. People might have infections around where the monitor goes. Um, some people don't like having a monitor attached to themselves, so there are those kind of technical issues. I think the other, the other kind of con is that 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 it's not what the, the monitor isn't actually in your blood; it's in the subcutaneous tissue. So the kind of relationship between the 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 the, the blood sugar and the blood level that the sugar the sugar level that the monitor is actually detecting isn't a hundred percent. So, so it takes people a little bit of time to get used to, and some of them, particularly, that's one of the reasons why the, the kind of automated inject, you know, got an ins if you have an insulin pump that's injecting you with insulin and a monitor that's checking your sugar, um, you could just let, let it all go automatically. Um, that, hasn't, that hasn't quite, I mean, it, some people do do that, but it's, it's not perfect. And part of the problem is that the, that the monitors aren't really detecting your absolute, your blood sugar. They're detecting kind of the sugar in your subcutaneous tissue. So it's not, it's not perfect. So you have to kind of get used to that and work out 
work out you know what that means what the monitor's saying and what that means about your actual blood sugar and it just means a, you know about how quickly things will change for example people are very lots of type 1 diabetics will know if they give themselves an injection of insulin how quickly their blood sugar will change and that may be different if they're using the monitor that they the continuous monitor so so i think there are there are some kind of t kind of practical issues and some technical problems but I think it's going to be the way forward. I think I think that they will get smaller. So I think the people that are bothered by them will become less bothered by them. I think the software that learn that works out, you know, how much insulin you should give will get better. I think that it will soon be the way, and I think that it will mean that people don't have to worry. You know, people with type one diabetes, at least, don't have to worry about their um about their blood sugar control in the same way they used to. And you know, for teenagers particularly, that's a massive thing because. Many, will, many people will know that it's in the teenage years of people with type, type 1 diabetes where control goes all over the place and that's when they're on a road to end-stage renal failure that can't be, can't be diverted from. I've seen these monitors advertised um, and the system and the uh, regular rental are quite expensive, but can people with type 1 diabetes get them on the NHS? So definitely. Um, so the rules are, they keep changing because of COVID. So um, type 1 diabetes, definitely. You can get them on the NHS. You just need to talk to a diabetes consultant. Um, and in fact, I'd be surprised if people with type 1 diabetes haven't had that discussion with their diabetes consultant. Type 2, 2 diabetes is a bit more complicated. Certainly, if you're not on insulin, then you won't get them. If you are on insulin, some people are, have been able to get them on the NHS, and I think it, I, I think it's a kind of it varies a bit. Certainly during COVID, they were encouraging that because partly, you know, you can you can monitor someone's blood sugar remotely, and you know, you can you don't have to go to clinic; you can just download your blood sugar readings. So, so there are all kinds of advantages to doing it, you know, that way, and you don't have to go to the chemist to pick up strips and all those kind of things. So, so they were they were um, definitely being released more generally, and I think that is still the case. If you've got type two diabetes and you're on insulin, particularly if your blood sugars are difficult to control. <laughs> you should be able to access it on the NHS. Okay, great. Look, the last question that I'd like to ask is regarding the risks that uh, those that don't have diabetes, um, what, what are there some short and simple things that you'd say to uh, CKD patients to make, uh, to help them avoid getting diabetes? And, I, and obviously there's, there, there's some obvious ones, but over to you. <laughs> yeah, they are. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if they're obvious, but they're, so I guess, as I said, we've got to think about this as, 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 a, as building up to a threshold. And what you want to avoid is ever getting to that level. And I guess as a CKD patient, the problem is, particularly if you're going to end up with end stage renal failure and need a transplant, there's get, you're going to be pushed up anyway, because you're going to receive those drugs that push you up towards that threshold. So if you can, uh, if you can make everything else, as, and we can't avoid that, so if you, if you can make everything else as low as all your other risks as low as possible, then that's really important. And the two major things are weight loss and exercise, really. They're the two, two big things. And of course, they're the two, two very difficult things to do. Um, and I know how difficult it is, particularly people with CKD, particularly on dialysis, how challenging it is to find time to do exercise. Um, but weight loss and exercise are very important and, and many people know that actually some of our transplant workup clinics will now talk a lot about weight. Um, and even if you're not diabetic, um, we're very, very keen on people, people um, losing weight before they're transplanted for one of the reasons. I mean, it's partly surgical reasons, but also the risk of diabetes following transplantation is so huge. Um, and so, so exercise, weight loss, lifestyle, dietary interventions, a healthy diet. And, you know, everyone has, on, at least everyone on dialysis and in the low clearance clinic has access to a dietitian and um you know a healthy diet is difficult when you've got kidney disease i know because you've got to worry about potassium and you've got to worry about other things but but that's really important too and i would say that these drugs that i mentioned the glp ones the once injections of the um semaglutide diloglutide are now being prescribed for people who are overweight even if they don't have diabetes to help people lose weight so so there will be also drug treatments um, people used to have surgery, gastric band surgery, etc. That that is probably going to be completely replaced by these injections. So, um, so I, I think, I mean, I would, I obviously promote lifestyle changes over drugs, but often people need all of them to lose weight because it is very, very hard. One of the things I showed you in that graph was it takes five or ten years to have an impact for a lot of these things. You know, you can start losing weight 
you know, if you, if you use a kilo or two a year, it can take another five years for that to translate into hard benefits in terms of not having diabetes or not having a heart attack. So, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a long, hard haul, and I don't underestimate that for anyone. So you won't, you, if you come to my clinic, you won't get a, a head teacher talking to you about weight. Um, it's hard. It really is. But, it yeah. should, but we should all try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, has anyone else got any other questions? Uh, I've got a number of messages in the, the chat, uh, uh, particularly from Fummi saying thank you so much that how much she enjoyed your talk. And I got to tell you, I uh, hope it's the same for everyone. I really found that not just enjoyable, but fascinating. So that's one of the best talks that we've had uh, at any of our AGMs. So thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, for that. David. Sorry? Can I say something, David? Yes, please, Patricia. Um, just a personal thanks to Ben for looking after me in hospital. He sent me home on Monday. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you, Pat. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I can remember Ben giving me permission to stay an extra day after my transplant because I didn't want to have to come in the next morning for a, uh, a checkup. So <laughs> thank, thank you for that. I don't expect that kind of special treatment again, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank, well, thank you very you... much for having me. It's a real pleasure. And, and, it's, and it's, you know, a really important, important thing for me to do as well, to have, to have the opportunity to talk to you guys. So it's, a really been, it's been really helpful. And thank you for me. Thank you. Uh, and, and it's great that we'll be able to put this on to our website. So it won't just be raw free patients that will get to see it it's patients that want to that google anything to do with diabetes and uh, techniques and methods there there's a chance that it's going to appeal to them uh, i understand if you want to go if you want to stay you're very welcome but okay. we'll understand the morocco game is over against <laughs> belgium morocco just beat belgium 2-0 surprisingly but anyway, well, i've got some ben... five-year-olds who are keen to have my attention so i might leave but thank, <laughs> thank you so, so much. much thanks thank you